Well, it has been said that one man's trash is another man's treasure. In other words, what one person would consider worthless, another might consider priceless. And so one man's trash is another man's treasure. And maybe you know that song that Oscar the Grouch sings on Sesame Street. Oh, I love trash. Anything dirty or dingy or dusty, anything ragged or rotten or rusty, yes, I love trash. Come on, let's sing it together. No, we're not going to do that. But it's, it's not just Oscar the Grouch who loves trash. I am here to confess to you all that my wife and I also love trash. In fact, we look forward to Sunday mornings, of course, for church and all the rest, but Sunday nights is something we also look forward to because that's the night we take in the trash. Now, some of you are saying, Pastor Scott, you've got it backwards. Don't you take out the trash? Well, in our house, yes, it's true. We do take out the trash, but we also take in the trash. Let me explain it. See, one nice feature of the neighborhood that we live in is that we get a weekly pickup of bulky items every week. It's not something we even have to schedule. Just any item of any size, and we've tested it. We've thrown things out there. It's always gone. Put it by the curb, and this truck with this big claw, you know, comes by, and it's fun to watch it, and it puts it in and hauls it away the next day. That is if someone else doesn't get to it first. See, on Sunday nights, People put out their trash, but people also come out to see what other people put out. And so Monday morning pickup, we try to beat it, you know, and one man's trash is another man's treasure. And so Sunday night, Len and I can often be seen hopping on the scooter (laughs) and going treasure hunting. We really do this. We ran into somebody from the church and they're like, we were going through the trash, and they, they said, hey, Pastor Scott, is that you? You know, think stuff over at the church or whatever. <laughs> no, and I tried to, you know, kind of get in and, and leave quickly. But, but much of what is there, of course, is true trash. That's true. And we know how to just zing right on past that. But alongside of some of that trash are some true treasures. See, we've found nice furniture for ourselves and for our friends. People actually who know us, well, they put in orders. Lynn will be taking orders afterwards. You know, what do you need? You need this? You need that? We'll be watching for it for you. We found chairs, desks, bicycles for all the kids. We found plants, we have patio sets, artwork, you know, nice stuff. People come over and compliment us on things in our house. Hey, where'd you get that? Well, in, in the trash can next door. <laughs> And you should see us, the real joy, the real fun part is trying to get all those things back on the Vespa. It's got two racks on it, and we've done some pretty amazing balancing acts there, and Lynn's only had to walk once. I, had, I did go back and get her, but uh, we would have made the Beverly Hillbillies jealous at several times, you know. And there's one particular one that I think is kind of funny, which is one time there was a nice set of brand new designer named Le- Leather suitcases I mean just really nice stuff sitting there beside the garbage can and I was just getting off the scooter parking and getting ready and checking on it when a lady came out of her house speaking Spanish da, 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 and, I, and all I heard was aeropuerto or something you know and, and no 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 you know and so I figured out enough to to know that she was on her way to the airport and had just put the <laughs> the bags out there for the taxi cab and And uh, fortunately, we rode away with no uh, consequences there. But our kids, of course, are just mortified by this idea. You know, even now, they're probably shrinking in their seats if they're even here this this evening because they're like, Dad, you're not going to say that you do this. We really can't believe that our parents are dumpster divers. You know, that's really really embarrassing. But this is true. One day, we found a working Xbox. And nobody ran out to tell us, no, 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 no. It was actually in the tra- a working Xbox. And my son said, you know, what? actually, I think this is a good idea. He never made fun of us again. And in fact, he now is our biggest encourager. He'll be like, Dad, hurry, hurry, hurry. There's probably good stuff going right now. You know, you've got to get out there and find it. So one man's trash is another man's treasure. Now, some of you, of course, are going to think we're weird. Other of you are saying, man, what night was it again? And how do I get there? But you should know uh, that we're in good company, actually. In fact, we're in God company. Why is that? Because God loves trash. He is, you might say, a spiritual dumpster diver. And if that sounds a little strange, maybe even bordering on sacrilegious, just stay tuned for tonight's teaching. You'll see that it's true. God in his word really says, you know what? I love to turn trash into treasure. That's what he's all about doing. It's what Ephesians 2 is all about tonight. We're going to look at it in three basic sections and just some things to think about here. Verse 1 through 7, it outlines this way. God brings life out of death. 
He brings life out of death. The second part, it's verses 8 through 10. God makes art out of trash. And then in the last section of the scripture there, verse 11 through 22, God builds his house out of scrap materials. And so Ephesians 2, let's look at it together. Verse 1, it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now we're just going to stop there in the first sentence and, and think about this for a moment. Our trash past, that's what this is going to talk about. And it says there, you who were dead. The NIV, I like the way it puts it. It says, as for you, you were dead. There's the diagnosis. You know, not just not feeling real well or a little under the weather. You were dead. And it's speaking spiritually there. It's saying, you know what? You can't get much lower than that. You know, dead. Well, how's he feeling? Well, he's dead. Okay, well, that's pretty bad. Death Valley here is what we're talking about. A trashed past. And the theme of this whole book of Ephesians, as we look through it, you'll see it's higher ground. That's why we themed the series that way. Life in the heavenlies. You know, living really at the mountaintop experience with God and and going from glory to glory and living above the uh, earthly plane, really. And I know, having grown up in the areas of mountains, that there are areas where you go up and it's just crisp and clean and it just you feel like you're the only person who has ever been there and then you see a coke can or something you go well okay at least somebody's been here but you contrast that with the highest mountain in miami we live just south of it it's mount trashmore right and that's what our life looked like before christ if you want a visual there a big pile of trash vultures circling around our life smelly that kind of thing and again we weren't just weak before christ we weren't just a little sickly no the bible says we were dead in sin and trespasses what is that surrounded by every manner of filth and if you think about what sin and trespasses are you know you say well i may have done one or both i don't know well intentional and unintentional rebellion against god it kind of covers the whole things things that you did knowing that it was wrong things you didn't quite know it was wrong and you figured that out later well that's what god assesses our life with and says that's dead in sin And it's amazing what modern medicine can do. You know, doctors are getting better at prolonging life all the time sometimes. And the thing is, a doctor can do a whole lot while there's still life in a body. You know, but only God really can deal with the dead. I mean, when it comes to dead, uh, that's God's area. And he loves to bring life out of death. He loves to bring abundant life out of abundant death. And he loves to turn trash into treasure. He brings that life to us. And we're going to talk about that, of course, but first some details on our trash past in case we have trouble remembering it or we think, no, no, it wasn't really that much. He says in verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works right now in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once walked conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Now, again, those verses right there paint a pretty smelly picture, a pretty stinky thing. And it's really painting again for us the picture of the walking dead. Physically alive, yes, you know, blood pumping, but spiritually dead. And without Jesus as the Lord of a life that's exactly what it is from god's perspective we're just a bunch of zombies just kind of roaming through the garbage dump you know looking for something and who's the king of that hell hill there verse two it's talking about the prince of the power of the air that's another way of referring to the devil and you see there in that section is something that's discussed at other parts in the bible but the three real enemies that team up in our life to trash us you know, it's, it's, we're, we're triple teamed, really. And you see verse 2, it says, the course of the world, the prince of the power of the air, and the lust of the flesh. That's us being our own worst enemies sometimes. And I think of it this way, you know, there were a brother and sister fighting, and that's what brothers and sisters often do. And the sister kicked and then bit her brother, just took a big, you know, bite out of him. And the mom went to break up the fight, because that's what moms do. And she said to the girl there, hey, you know, why did you let the devil convince you to kick and bite your brother like that? 
And the sister, being an honest one, said, well, actually, Mom, you know, it was the devil who told me to kick him, but biting him, that was my idea. <laughs> and so you see that, you know, there's kind of a cooperation of sin there sometimes. And when these three things get in alignment, boy, look out. The world, the devil, our flesh, working together to trash our lives in sin and trespass. And you think about the words that people even use for parting, right? They say, oh, man, we were so wasted. It was awesome. You go, well, we're wasted. Okay. Yeah, man, we were so trashed. You go, well, yeah, that's what the Bible says. And some might say, well, wait a minute, that, that's not me. You know, I wasn't one of those kind of party animals that way. But, you know, this is the thing. All lost sinners are dead. All sinners are dead without Christ. The only difference between one sinner and another really is the state of decay. You know that you say, well that one is badly decomposed, but that one's just getting started. And you see in verse 3, lustful desires of the flesh and the mind. It's saying, you know, not only the outward stuff, but what goes on inside a person's mind as well. And that all added up to us being children of wrath. Now, you see there it's by nature and by choice. And I think this is interesting because no one ever had to teach a child to disobey. We just had my uh, niece and nephew here, you know, and, and I was amazed, you know, because our kids were wonderful when they were that age and everything, but I was just amazed at some of the disobedience that went on in my, in my sister's sister-in-law and brother-in-law's uh, kids, you know. You just say, wow, uh, were ours like that too, you know? And, and they were. We never had to ever say to them, you know, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab the toy and say, mine, you know, and, and then rush just to the one toy that they're playing with and then fight with them on that and then move to the next toy as soon as somebody shares and all the rest of that. Well, that's what kids do. They're just that way children of wrath. And the result, of course, of sin and disobedience is wrath. God's holiness demands righteousness. And a just judge will condemn sin. If anyone has problems with that, they really don't understand the holiness of God. And some would say at that point, but Scott, you said God loves trash. Oh yeah, he does. It's true. He loves trash. But unlike Oscar the Grouch, God doesn't love trash to stay trash, to stay ragged and rotten and rusty. See, God loves to turn trash into treasure. He loves to bring life out of death. And God loves our trash when it's part of the past. See, when he can say, yeah, that was trash, but now it's turned to treasure. Now, how do we know that? Because we can look at the key word in verse 2 and 3. It says once. If you have a pen, circle and star that, underline it or something. It says, we once walked in these ways. It says, we once conducted ourselves this way in verse 3. And so again, I call it our trashed past. Now that doesn't mean there's never any trash in our present. But it's really not to be the characteristic of a Christian, to have a trashed present, to have a trashed future. You'll see it in this chapter here, that our trash is really part of our past. Now again, there's going to be a residual stink sometimes in our life, a little bit of things that God has to deal with along the way. And the thing is, if you really honestly evaluate your life and you look at it and say, you know what, I don't think I could say that this description here in verses 2 and 3, this is a, a description of my past, it's really a, a description of right now in my life. Well, you of all people really need to play, pay very close attention to today's teaching because God brought you here for a real reason, which is to take in the trash and then to take the trash out of your life and leave it with treasure. That's what... The Bible says that you would be brought here not on accident, but to get saved. Saved from sin and trespasses. Saved from the spiritual dump. And you say, well, how do I do that? Well, there'll be an opportunity at the end of tonight to commit your life to Christ. That's how you do it. That's how he takes out the trash in our life. But you see, you contrast these things. Verse 1, 2, and 3. He says, you, dead. That's what we can do. But then verse 4, 5, and 6, it's great. It starts with, but God. It's a contrast there saying, here's what you're going to see God can do with a life that looks like that. It says he made us alive from trash to treasure. And so that's the first major point there, just to review it in your mind. It's that God brings life out of death. Look at it with me in verse 4. It says, but God who's rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
So I remind, remind you again, it says we were dead, trashed. But what's great about that is God didn't throw out the trash. He took in the trash. And he loves trash. He's, he's rich in mercy, the Bible says. He's got great love, great grace. And spiritually speaking, this is what happened. God took us from the trash heap and he seated us, it says, right next to Christ in a place of honor. He brought us from the outside, you know, from the curbside into his heavenly house. And he took us from the tomb to the throne. And it might interest you to know that that's really the exact route that Jesus took physically, literally. See, what happened is, if you'll glance back at Paul's prayer, Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, that Pedro will eventually get to, this is what it says, that we might experience the exceeding greatness of God's power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he did what? It says right there, he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. You see what the scripture is saying right there? It's saying we, we went from child of wrath to child of God. We are right now presently in God's eyes from his perspective, not trash anymore, but treasure spiritually seated with Jesus in the heavenly and that God would treasure us like he treasures his own son. And if you notice something in the verses there in 5 and 6, it's all past tense there. It's all in the past tense verb. And that means our salvation is a present reality, that we can enjoy it right now, that the benefits are here for us right now. They will be realized completely in all eternity, but we have a foretaste of them right now. And from God's perspective, it is finished. It is accomplished and complete. Now, what does that mean to us practically? This is what it means. It's so wonderful. Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2, if you cross-reference that, the first two verses there in Colossians 3, it says, if you were raised in Christ, which of course you were, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of earth. What is he saying there? Well, in the context of what we're looking at in Ephesians Seek higher ground. Live above the earthly plane. Not to say that you're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. No, the very thing is that if you are heavenly minded, you'll be earthly good. It'll change the way you live. It'll change your whole perspective. And he's just saying, get your mind off the trash, the trash of your past. That doesn't have to be the trash of your present or your future. Get it onto the truth, out of the gutter and into the glory that God has for us. And to realize that you are God's treasure, that he would take you and say, hey, you're not trash, you're treasure. Well, that should do something in our heart and make us want to live like God's treasure. You see in verses 4 and 5 of Ephesians 2, it says, why did he do this? Because he loves trash. Look, it says, because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead. It doesn't say because we were so clean and smelled so wonderful that he couldn't help but love us. No, it says, even while we were dead. You know, every once in a while, uh, I'll be driving along and you realize something is roadkill. You know, you realize mm, something dead is around here. Why? Because the smell is just a very, very strong smell. And so you see that, that even while that was the characteristic of our life, that the sin and trespasses, God would say, whew, something stinks. But he knows that, hey, with that trash, with my touch, there can be treasure. And so sin did trash us, certainly, but God still loved us. And that's so important to know, that balance right there. It keeps us humble, but it gives us faith that God would touch even a life like that. And I can picture God kind of humming that song as he goes along. Oh, I love trash. You know, hey, there's something rotten. There's something wretched. Yeah, but I could do something with it. And God loves us just the way we are, but that doesn't mean he wants to leave us that way. He loves us too much to leave us that way. And so this is what he did. He made us alive. He rescued us from the dump, but he sent us on a different trajectory there toward heaven. And here's a thought. It's a good one to think sometimes. If God loved you then, when you had that trash past, when you were in trespasses, when you were dead in sin, how do you think he feels about you now that you're alive in Christ. You know, sometimes people will get down and condemned and all the rest because they'll make a mistake or they just think, well, I don't know if God really loves me. Listen, the Bible says that he loved you even while you were dead. So when he's cleaning you up in Christ and cleaned you up in Christ, 
How much more do you think he loves you now? And so you look at these things together with Christ, in Christ, all the way throughout this chapter. It's always our association with him that makes us the transition there from trash to treasure. Without Christ, well, still trash. With Christ, treasure. And so God has taken us in and he's given us the best seats in the heavenly house. That's what it says. They're seated next to Christ. And I think about this several years ago, you know, Stephen and I went to a Christian concert and we went to the American Airlines Arena. It was a big event. There were lots of people there and it was free, actually. It was a general admission thing. It was free. And because the price was free, there were a lot of people there and I, you know, we said, hey, that's, that's my price. Uh, we'll go, you know. And so we got there kind of late. I couldn't get there in time. And, and so we were in the nosebleed section, as they affectionately call it. You know, now they call it downtown if you go to a heat game or uptown you know but it's the nosebleed it's the cheap seats and so before it started here with the concert we were just kind of walking down around some different areas and I heard Scott I looked over you know and there's a hand waving way down there you know a little little uh, little very small person and and uh, well they're normal size but from where I was they look small and so I got down there we finally got down there and they said hey we have two saved seats we're not going to use them. You guys want to use them? Now, think about this. We didn't deserve them. We didn't get there in time for them. We didn't earn them. We didn't pay for them. There was nothing in the world except that this family here raised us up together with them, and they made us to sit in the best seats of the house. And in the same way, God has saved seats for you. That's something to know, that God has a seat for you that he says, hey, I got it reserved, but you have to come up here and get it. And that's what it means. When the Bible says that we are saved by grace, that God gives it to us, we can't earn it, we can't deserve it, but he has reserved it for us. And you see in just these few verses from our trash past to our blessed present to our glorious future that we're going to have, well, that's what you see in verse 7. He says, in the ages to come, that he might show the exceeding riches of the grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now, what that means is that for all eternity, God is going to have proof of his grace and mercy in our lives. And it'll take him really all of eternity to demonstrate his greatness and his grace and mercy. And, and I like to think of it this way, that we would be like trophies of God's grace, that he might be able to point to our life and say, man, now there is one that I did something special with. I, I don't know if you know any uh, fishermen or fisherwomen who like to have, you know, mounted fish in their in their. Uh, den or in their house or whatever you know and you go to their house and it's, it's a fish that they caught you know and they mounted that fish and, and they love to tell the story oh man this one fought me I had it on the line you know I gave it and they'll tell the story it'd take a three-hour story to tell how they reeled in this fish and but I got them and they're on the wall now and all that you know and in the same way you know what I think God maybe will have a special place for ones that put up a fight you know, then he'd be able to say, oh boy, yeah boy, this one ran for 48 years, man, but I reeled him in. I got him going, I gave him a little line, I, you, know, I, you know, all this sort of thing. And, and you think about that and you say, yeah, the, sometimes the ones that resist the most, what a blessing it is when that person finally realizes, hey, he's not catching me to mount me on the wall somewhere, you know, and stuff me. I mean, he wants to do so much more with our life. And maybe right now here tonight, you're resisting his love. Maybe you're still fighting him. And this is the question. You know, so many people have, what will he do if he catches me? What will he do if he catches you? Well, it's really a catch and release in a sense because he releases you to live the life that you were meant to live. That's what God wants to do. He says, I want you to stop running so that you can start resting in my love and start living a life that that really I planned for you because he has a great great plan for our life as we're going to see in the next section and so why did God do this why did he uh, love us was it that he saw something valuable in us you know oh man there's trash in there but there's a treasure in here somewhere you know that's not it at all that's not the picture you need to have in your mind see the thing is God is able as only God is able to actually convert trash to treasure it's not that he finds the treasure among the trash it's that he can actually do something with it and bring life out of death yes but make art out of trash and you see that in Ephesians 2 8 9 and 10 and these are some of the best known and most loved 
verses in the Bible with good reason. If you don't already know where they are or you're discovering them for the first time tonight, again, make sure you get a highlighter so you can find them again. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. These are amazing verses to know and to share. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And there's so much that could be mined here. Literally, this could be, you know, hours and hours of, of discussion and a lifetime, really, of discovery in here. But let's start with just a few of the things in here, which is salvation is in here. It talks about being saved. And, and you know, that's a word that Christians sometimes throw around and everything else, but it's good to know, what, what is it talking about? Saved from what? Well, salvation means to rescue something from destruction, from disaster, it means taking in the trash, as we've talked about here, rescuing us. You know, we were on our way to the dump, spiritually, and God says, hey, I'm going to save you out of that. I'm going to have you not only have an eternal life at the end of this one, but I'm going to change the life you're living right now and give you the best possible life you could have walking here with me. Now, how does that happen? Again, it's by grace through faith. What does that mean? Well, faith... I think in just a simple way, it's simply the hand that receives the gift of God. God gives a gift and he just set, holds it out to us and he says, you know, faith is the thing that embraces that grace that says, yes, Lord, I want that. I need that. Believing and receiving what God is giving. That's what grace is all about. Undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor of God. Not because there was something great in us, but because God is great and his great love for us. And so while we were trash, he made us his treasure. That's, that's what we see scripturally. And so we can be saved simply because God loves trash. And because he is able to look and say, you know, I can do something with that. And if you think about it, you know, sometimes people say, don't all religions really teach the same thing? No, they don't. You know, go study them sometime. They don't teach the same thing. In fact, Christianity is the only one that teaches grace, that God is the one who gives what we can't earn. See, everything else has kind of a system by which you earn enough points that you climb the mountain. God's at the top of the mountain. And if you'll get up there, the guru will give you the answers to life, you know, and that sort of thing. And God says, no, no, actually, I, I look down in Death Valley. I look down in the trash heap, and I say, hey, anybody who would like to come up here can come up here simply by believing. <gasps> wow. There is no other belief system like that. Nobody else but God would dare to give grace to men and women. But you see, salvation can't be earned, it can't be deserved, it can't be merited, and God loves us just because he loves trash. And more than that, God loves to turn the trash into treasure, his treasure. That's what you see in that verse there where it says, we are his workmanship. You know, it's kind of a slang phrase these days to say, ooh, that guy's a piece of work. You know, and it, and it means, ooh, that's, that's one that's going to take a lot of work. You know, that's somebody who needs some tune-up. And uh, he said, wow, he's a piece of work. Well, you know what? Everyone could look on and say, hey, we're a piece of God's work. That's what he is doing in our life. You are his workmanship. The word there literally means poem or work of art, a masterpiece made by the master. And so again, a great reminder for us as believers, or maybe it's something that you're hearing for the first time here tonight in this much clarity with the scripture saying that, that you were headed toward the dump and God plucked you out of the dumpster to make you his masterpiece. That's what he wants to do with, his, with your life. Again, what will he do if he catches me? Make you a masterpiece. Make, make you a priceless treasure. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. No, but see, it says here, no one can boast. I love this. It says, God did it this way because he knew if there was any other way, We'd get to heaven and we'd ruin it with our boasting and bragging. You know, how'd you get here? Well, I walked across the state of Florida on my knees while memorizing the whole New Testament backwards in original Greek. <laughs> oh, that's what it took to get here for you? Well, you know what? I was trash and he uh, picked me up and made me a treasure. <laughs> he, I was dead and he made me alive. See, there's no way to boast about anyone other than Christ with that. And so verse 10 says, a workmanship, a work of art. And Michelangelo was once asked, what are you doing there, chipping away day and night at that? And, he, and the way he expressed it was so artistic and beautiful. He said, I'm liberating an angel from that marble block. 
And that's what I'm doing. I'm setting it free. And you think about this. It's like God looks at our life and says, man, there's a saint in there somewhere. Right now they look more like an ain't. But I am liberating Scott from his deadness, from his selfishness, from his sin, from his Scottness, from his trashy past. I'm making him a masterpiece of my grace that it'll take all of eternity to really enjoy. And so verse 10, he says, not by works, but I love it, but for them. See, not by works, but for them. I think that's about as clear a statement in the scriptures of the gospel of what it could possibly be. God's grace will transform a life. It comes with power-packed things in it that actually God is able to transform and change us. And he has a path that he has planned for us, and it's the best possible path for us. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's going to be trouble-free. But it's not because we are good people that God gets a hold of us. And it's not because we're good people that he stays a hold of us. But when God's got a hold of you, it's going to do something good in your life. It's going to change your life. And you see that it's not the works that are the price of salvation, but certainly the proof of it, certainly the outpouring of it, certainly the evidence of it, that when God inhabits a life, when God, the creator of the universe, comes into a heart and life, I've got to believe there's going to be some dramatic changes. Some of them are going to take some time, but they are going to be there. And I like to think of it with the pictures that the Bible gives, which is Lazarus. Think of the life of Lazarus. You know, he was dead, right? And it was kind of funny because the, uh, the disciples didn't immediately understand Jesus. He said, Lazarus is actually sleeping, you know, and he was talking about him being dead. And they said, well, let's go wake him up. And uh, Jesus said, no, guys, he's dead. And Oh, well, I guess we won't wake him up then. And, and Jesus still waits a little while. Now he's dead uh, long enough that the King James Bible says he stinketh, you know, which is a really cool way of putting that. But he, he's, uh, he stinketh, man. And so he says to him, Lazarus, come forth. You know, and Lazarus comes out and it says that at that point, Jesus told him something interesting. Take the grave clothes off him. Now, in that day, when they put grave clothes on somebody, it wasn't just like their best suit or something. They actually wrapped them in this thing that made them look kind of like a mummy. So you can picture, I don't know how he came out or if he hopped or, you know, he kind of floated or something. But he came out wrapped and, and Jesus said, hey, unwrap the guy. He doesn't need to go through the rest of his life in grave clothes. You know, but he's alive again, but he, he looks dead. No. I, and nobody said, he stinketh when he did come out. You know, because God was doing a work in Lazarus' life that didn't just end there at the grave. And so as a Christian, you have been raised and seated on the very side of, of God there. And, and the thing is, by faith, what we do, the same way we come to God, we live by, by faith also and by God's grace. And what is it? To just practice your position in Christ, to set your mind on things above. When, when the devil and the world and your flesh wants to drag it back down, say, you know what? I like the higher ground, you know? I like the real high life. I mean, Miller doesn't have that one, actually. You know, God has the real high life. And so God has worked for you. That's what salvation's all about. But he wants to work in and through you, and he will. And I love it because it says those good works were prepared for you in advance. Now, does this make us a robot? You know, some people go, oh, no. There's stuff prepared for me in advance. What if I don't do it? Are you going to do it? It's prepared in advance. For, well, you mean I have to do it? No, you don't have to do it. But you get to do it. You know, you think about it this way. God is preparing things that you will enjoy doing. You, you think of it this way. The, the teachers in kids' ministry, you know, during the week, uh, Pastor JP and the other volunteers here and everything, they're not thinking, what can we do to make the kids miserable? You know, what can we do that, yeah, I hate that. Yeah, let's do that. We'll have them eat spinach. And then after that, we'll do, you know, we'll make them do a bunch of calisthenics. And then we'll do the, no. What do they do? They're all week long. They're, oh, they're looking through catalogs. This would be a blessing. This would be cool. They love doing this. Using their creativity to bless those kids. Prepared in advance. And they set those things out. So when the kids come, all they got to do is walk in the will of the teachers. And so God is... Just like that, an artist, we the masterpiece. And you might say, well, you know, that sounds good in theory, but I gave my life to Christ, hey, even a little while ago, and my life is trashed. I mean, my marriage is still trashed. My job is trashed. My finances are trashed. 
Well, that's because you need to go get more free things on the side of the road. But <laughs> my emotions are trashed. You know, my, my health is trashed. My relationships, all this trashed. Well, you know, if a person hasn't put their faith in Christ, I would say, well, of course it is. <laughs> you know, that, what would you expect? But even once after a person does do that, sometimes there is a lag time. Because, you know, if there's one thing that I've learned, it's never to judge a work of art in progress. If you guys were here for the Easter service, you know that we had the chalk guy. And I don't know about you, but I constantly, I, that guy makes me very nervous. Why? Because he keeps messing up the picture. I'm like, no, no, don't, ah, you know, don't do, don't, oh, no, you know. He'll, he'll get something that looks like it's going good and then, and oh, forget it. You know, we're never going to, it's never going to finish. And then, voila, he's done and you go, that was awesome. So judging a work of art in progress is always a mistake. You've got to trust the artist's abilities when he says, hey, I've got good works for you to do in advance. I prepared them for you. I'm going to prepare you for doing those things. He's going to do it. I remember a few years ago, this was really brought home to me in such a, a personal and beautiful way. We were out at Biscayne National Park, which is right out um, by our house, and they were sponsoring an exhibit there, an art exhibit. <laughs> And there was an artist there who took trash from the national parks. You know, it was things that he had actually found in the parks and turned it into artwork. And there were these beautiful, elaborate things, you know, multicolored fish. He, he did mainly uh, sea creatures of all types and things, octopus and all the rest, made from styrofoam, made from broken bottles, made from old car parts and, you know, broken tires and all this, some of the samples there here. And these pictures don't do him justice. I mean, in real life, these things were huge and just... Amazing, and you'd look at them, and then you'd start looking closer and realize, oh my gosh, that's a flip-flop. You know, the flipper's a flip-flop and stuff like this. And, and next to each one of these was a story, and that was the best part of the exhibit. You know, I could have spent all day there just reading down through the stories of where the trash came from and what the artist's reaction was when he found it and how he painstakingly transformed this trash into treasure. The most Im impressive sculpture there, you know, it was really big. It, he talked about how it was this smelly hunk of moldy dock styrofoam. You know, they'd just been uh, behind a bush for a long time. And he said he spied it, you know, underneath this thing. And he said he could smell it before he saw it. You know, it's like there's something around here that's going to be great. And he said in the original state, you know, most people would have held their nose and run the other way. But he was like... He ran to it and he said, I literally hugged it. I, I embraced it. I was like, yes, this is going to be my greatest masterpiece. And he said he had to bleach it for two days to get the smell out so that other people would be able to stand it. And he painted it and he inlaid hundreds of little broken glass pieces and bits into the foam. Just each one of those broken glass bottles making this transformed thing. And, and the, it was just brilliant out there in the sun. Something beautiful that used to be trash. And again, the best part about it was that it was made from something ugly, that something so beautiful was made from something ugly. And that's when, instead of the masterpiece getting all the attention, the master gets the attention, where people go, whoa, how did that become that? And it's when you say, because it was in the hands of the master. And so there's no shortage of those who can find fault with Christians. You know, why? Because Christians have no shortage of faults. The people who come and say, ah, oh, you guys aren't that great. You know, you've got shortcomings, you've got problems, all this. And whenever I hear that, I don't even try to defend myself anymore. And I don't even bother defending most of you. You know, I just, ah, oh, whatever. You know, but I simply say, you know what, you're right. You're right, but you ought to see where they used to be. You know, and they ain't all that right now. But you ought to see what they came from. If you, that's when you'd really be amazed at what the master's doing. And listen, we're not done yet. You know, you're going to get to see the finished product in heaven. And can I tell you how to get there? That's the kind of thing that God is wanting to do in our life. And the remainder of the chapter, it keeps the same theme. And God turns trash into treasure. And we're going to go kind of quickly through these verses because next chapter, uh, we're going to deal with this theme even more. But it's this, that God builds his house out of scraps, out of leftover lumber, out of old materials. It's an analogy that Paul is talking about here. He loves to do that, to paint pictures for us. And he's talking about the church. That's what the book of Ephesians is really about, is, is God's work in the church, what he's doing, what it means to be part of God's faith family. And so it's not a physical structure. It's not about a building. 
But he uses that because people can understand God's building, God's house, the temple, the tabernacle, all of these different pictures in people's mind. And he just basically tells them in this pictorial language, you know what? It was made out of scrap. It was made out of leftover lumber, a pile of rubble, really. And the original readers would have understood right away what Paul was saying. And we might need a little bit of help because it's kind of rooted in, in biblical history and culture. So what you're going to see is in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, Paul uses that powerful picture, the most powerful picture he could have used in his day to demonstrate God's ability to take trash and turn it into treasure. And what was it? He said, look, he's building the church out of Gentiles. I mean, look what he had to work with. And not only Gentiles, but Jews, he being one of those. But he says in verse 11, look, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens, you know, not like green uh, aliens, but uh, people who didn't have a homeland, from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's a pretty sad sentence right there. No hope without God. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who's made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. That means the hostility, the anger, the separation. That is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Verse 16 and 17, we'll stop there for a moment to comment on this, that he might reconcile them both to God, one body, that's the church, through the cross, therefore putting to death the enmity. He came and preached peace to you who were afar off and those who were near. Now again, you can see how you could get bogged down in that and say, I don't get what Paul is saying. They would have understood what he was saying because this was their everyday life. The contrast here between Jew and Gentile was enormous in their society. It, it was the dividing factor. It was the defining thing. And here he was saying to this Gentile church predominantly, listen, you guys were once far off and you know that. You were as pagan as pagan could be. You didn't even pretend to be religious. You had no promises, you had no scriptures, you had no temple, you had no tabernacle, you had no understanding of God, you had no hope. Completely hopeless. And he says, yeah, the Jews were new, near. They were near. They had the promises. They had the scriptures. They had the old covenant. They had knowledge of God. But they were near, but not near enough. Because if you think about the way the Old Testament tabernacle there, the temple was laid out, what you see is that there was something called the court of the Gentiles, and that was like way outside. They were out in the parking lot, kind of going, well, we'd like to get closer, but we can't. They'll kill us. And so they could come that close. You know, you can come to church, but you got to stay in the parking lot. And then you had the Jews who could come closer, but they couldn't come into the very presence of God. They had to kind of hang out, out in the foyer. You know, okay, you can come in a little closer. You're near, but you're not really connected to God. And it was when God, through Christ, said, listen, there is no dividing wall anymore between Jew or Gentile or between any person in me who comes to faith in Christ. That's what he's saying here. And he says the key here is that the Gentiles really, really, really needed Christ, and so did the Jews. So close, but yet so far. And to have access to God, well, Romans 1, 16 says, Paul, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe, first for the Jew, then the Gentile, basically saying, look, everybody's got to come and gets to come through the gospel. And if Jesus is able to make a person like Paul, who was once a Gentile hater, I mean, this is a guy who woke up every morning as a Pharisee and prayed, I thank God I'm not a slave, a woman, or a Gentile. You know, it would have been a real nice guy to meet, you know. But turned him around to where he actually laid down his life for slaves, for Gentiles, and for ladies, and men, anybody who would come to Christ. Who could change a guy like that? To take a guy like that from trash to treasure. Well, you see him using that example. And the Ephesians, again, were mostly Gentiles. And Paul's explaining to this Gentile group how they were now part of God's household of faith. And they were being built up into the building of God's kingdom in the same way as anybody else. 
And as we'll see that analogy, he's saying, you're the building materials, and look what God had to work with. Guys like me, Paul would say. The chief of sinners. A guy who was real religious, brought up in a religious system, but self-righteous and thought he was good enough to work his way to God and found out he wasn't. And found out he was no better than the most pagan, pagan, pagan out there who would come humbly in faith to Christ. And so that's what you see him there saying, you know what, we as Jews used to think you guys were wasted materials, you know, a waste of skin, useless scrap of humanity. And there's never been a greater divide than there is between the Jews and Gentiles in those days, racial, spiritual, political hatred that went generations back. And so now Paul says, instead of, hey, you Gentiles, you're just fuel for hell. That's the kind of way they used to talk. He says, no, in fact, you guys are now God's very treasure, that you would be the ones he would build and place in a place of honor. And you see in verse 18 through the end here, he brings home that point. He says, for through him, Jesus, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom that whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. I love that last verse there. You also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, God in the Old Testament would dwell in the most holy place there in the temple. You know, it was the one place where he would be. And what he's done here is he has broken down that thing and said, you know what, your heart is going to be my home. I'm going to indwell human lives and I'm going to come into trashed lives and I'm going to make them into treasure. It's, it's like he could take a crack house and turn it into a beautiful building here. And you see, today, again, God indwells believers, not buildings. And you've seen those signs, maybe, the billboards, we buy ugly houses, you know, we buy ugly houses. And I don't, my kids thought that was really funny the first time they said, it. they said, Dad, who would admit they had an ugly house if they did? You know, they wouldn't want to call, hi, I have an ugly house, you know. <laughs> maybe you should call on, you know, intervention on behalf of somebody else. Hi, I know someone who has an ugly house, you know. <laughs> but, but it's like God would run a billboard that says, listen, I buy ugly lives. I bought ugly lives. And he pays more than top dollar. He paid with his very life for it. And so he'll buy a dead, ugly, trash life and transform it into treasure, into a beautiful building, into a dwelling place for his spirit, in which he'd say, you know what? That's a life that I have good works planned in advance for. A totally different direction for that life. And again, one man's trash another man's treasure. What one person considers worthless, another person considers priceless. And Jesus thought we were worth saving. And he didn't just pick us up off the corner for free. He paid for us, bought us for a price. And so if you think about those things, I just want to close out with an invitation. If you're here tonight and you say, you know what? <laughs> Again, I don't think my past is trashed. I think my present is trashed. And I'm a little afraid that my future is trashed. You know, well, God has a different path for you. By your merit? No, by His grace, by His mercy, by His Son. And so, we give that opportunity, we give that call here. Every time we meet. Why do we do that? Because it's that important. And, and there's really only two groups of people in the world, which are the saved and unsaved. And, and if you're saved, man, pray for those who aren't. If you're a person who has assurance of your relationship with God, pray for those who don't. And so we have that opportunity. How do we do it? Well, it, God makes it so easy. He says, faith is just the hand that takes the grace that I give. And so if you find yourself saying, man, I, I'm, I'm in sin and trespasses. I, I'll admit, I, I am trashed. And I need a Savior. I need somebody to come and, and pick me up out of that and do something with my life. Well, it's just an acknowledgement of that. And so what we're going to do, we're going to close our eyes. We're going to bow our heads, we're going to pray, and at the end of that prayer, I'm going to give you an opportunity just to raise your hand and acknowledge your need. And I'll pray with you a prayer that opening, of opening your heart to Christ, of allowing Him in as your Lord, as your Savior, and living the rest of your life to follow and please Him. 
And so let's bow our heads, let's close our eyes. And Father, I thank you now for the fact that you have given us such a clear path to salvation. Lord, you have given us a gospel that is simple enough for a child to understand and yet profound enough for an adult to think about and wrestle with and glory in for their entire life and for all eternity. And God, I pray for any here tonight who might not have made that decision, that declaration, Lord. They think that maybe because they were brought up in a religion or they've come to church or they tried to be a good person or, or whatever else, that that's okay. But Lord, you made it so clear that all need to come to Christ, Jew and Gentile, good relatively and bad. All need to come to Christ and all can simply by putting their faith in Him. And so with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, if there's anyone here tonight who wants to make that decision to say, yeah, I, I want my sin forgiven. I want to follow after Christ. I want my life to go from trash to treasure. I want to know that I have eternal life, forgiveness of sin. I want the guilt to be gone from my life. I want to live a life that I'll find out what the plan of God is for me because the way I've lived so far hasn't gotten me very far. If that's you, right where you're sitting, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand, acknowledge your need, and I'll lead you in that prayer. Anybody here? I see you there. God bless you. Anyone else? Anyone else? God bless you. I see you over here on the side. Anyone else here tonight? God loves you. He loves trash, but he doesn't want to leave you that way. Anybody else before we pray tonight? For those of you who raised your hand, I'm going to invite you just to pray this prayer along with me tonight. Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for my sin and rose again to give me life. I believe in you, Lord. And I want to follow you all the days of my life. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. I open my heart to you and I invite you inside. Be my Lord, my Savior, my friend. And show me your ways, Lord, and give me the power by your Spirit to live a life pleasing to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.